So today, as you read in the Gospel reading, we come to the account of Jesus' appearances to his followers following his resurrection. And this kind of climax of the Gospel gives John, the Gospel writer, a chance to tell us why he's written this whole Gospel at all. And it actually comes in the two verses following the reading you heard. He writes in verse 30 of chapter 20, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John's writing 30 to 40 years later, probably uh, from the community he pastors in Ephesus, which is a ways from Jerusalem. Um, Of course, he writes as an eyewitness. John was there to see it all. Uh, But he's speaking to people who, none of whom, likely were there. It's decades later. It's in a different part of the Mediterranean. And so John says, you know, I've been telling you all these things. Here's why. It's that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that believing, you would experience life in him. So we're, right, in much the same situation as those folks, right? We weren't there. We're hearing about it from eyewitnesses. But his purposes for us are the same. That we would believe Jesus is God and that our belief in Jesus as God would deepen. And that our connection to him as the giver of life would deepen. And I think John writes, especially for those who might be skeptical, why else would he include this story? He says, says actually, there's many things uh, that occurred that I haven't written in the gospel. So John was selective. Uh, But he selected the story of Thomas to be told here. That even those who might be skeptical might come to actually believe or deepen their belief that Jesus is the Son of God and in him is found life. So today we're going to talk about belief and what deepens belief. Um, Meditating on this passage this week, I had... um, I thought of my wife, Dottie, uh, right here. Dottie is a believer, all right? Now, I don't mean that just in the um, specific arena of faith. I mean more broadly, Dottie is an enthusiastic truster of people. Um, Their words and their motives. I've cleared all of this, by the way. Um, I kind of signed an NDA when I became a speaker, so uh, all the examples I used have to be vetted. I, on the other hand, would not call myself an, I am an enthusiastic believer in the arena of faith, I can say that, but not so much otherwise. I'm I'm skeptical with a dash of cynicism. Um, And now there's both pros and cons to the Dottie believing approach and the Todd skeptical approach to life in general. Um, But of course, I want to give you uh, an example of the believing approach, again, within the terms of the NDA. uh, so, for instance, we used to have a blockbuster video store uh, very near us, right? That's the thing of the past. But this became a weekly kind of ritual for us, as I'm sure for some of you, you go and you find a movie. And, of course, when you go together as a, as a, as a married couple, that, that is a, boy, that is a deepening of trust right there. Um, that's a negotiation, right? That's, uh, but it's even more of a deepening of trust when only one person goes to pick the movie for the two of you. So... Occasionally, I would just say, Dottie, you go pick a movie for us, um, and she'd she'd do it, and sometimes I'd go alone too, but when she'd go, um, she'd come back often with a movie, and I'd say, why'd you pick that one? And she would say, now, Dottie is like the friendliest person I know. I mean, literally, I think she's the friendliest person I know. So she knew all the employees at Blockbuster. And she would say, well, Kevin recommended this. Kevin. Uh, He thinks it's a great movie. I thought, oh, okay. Um, I did not know Kevin, uh, probably not even to say hi. And I knew he didn't know me. Um, As a result, Kevin's recommendations didn't hold a lot of weight with me. Um, I would think, and I would sometimes say to Dottie, did Kevin, for instance, look at our rental history before he made this recommendation? (laughs) Do you know what Kevin's criteria are for a good movie? Uh, 
Should we take into account that Kevin is a teenage male? <laughs> and might have different tastes in movies? Is Kevin incentivized by the company to push certain movies? Was Kevin just free associating? Seeing the first thing that came to his mind. See, I have a lot of skepticism about people's suggestions in this case. Now, I think these are reasonable questions, frankly. I don't think it really makes me a skeptic. I think it just makes me reasonable. Um, thank you. But I'm so grateful that John includes the account of Thomas, whom I think might not have been unusually skeptical, but is an example of the questions that arise when one hears of an miraculous event. Um, whatever our default positions are. So as we approach the account of Thomas and Jesus, it is first good to remember that Jesus appeared to four groups of people the same day as his resurrection. So think last Sunday, right? Mary goes to the tomb in the morning. He's not there. That day, Jesus, the risen Jesus, appears to four groups of people. He appears to Mary, of course, Mary Magdalene, and the women with her. He appears to the two dejected disciples walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, that kind of uh, seven-mile journey. He appears to 10 of the disciples that evening, minus Judas, of course, and minus Thomas, who, talk about bad time not to be there, um, was not there. Um, and so we kind of pick up the story after Jesus has met with all of those. Um, and when Thomas finally gets together with the disciples. And of course, their joy at the risen Jesus is uncontainable. And so when they see Thomas come, they, they tell him, we have seen the Lord. And then you have Thomas's famous response. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You know, it really is hard to build a psychological profile of figures in the scriptures from what little we get. I think sometimes we go overboard in our, uh, in our, in our zeal to do so. Um, it's, but it's fair to say for all of them that re the resurrection of the Messiah was not on the radar. I mean, the death of the, the premature death of the Messiah was not on the radar, but certainly not the resurrection of the Messiah. Um, and there are some important Old Testament passages that I think the disciples, including Thomas, missed regarding the eternal presence of Jesus with them and some New Testament passages where Jesus speaks of that to them. Um, and by most accounts, Thomas was a faithful disciple. Um, there's a little, there's an anecdote a little earlier in chapter 11 in John when Jesus finally, remember, resolves to go to Lazarus in Bethany, but Lazarus who's very sick. And his disciples are very anxious because last time Jesus was in that region, he almost got stoned to death. Um, and so the disciples are saying, you know, don't go to, don't go, uh, to Judea. Um, Thomas is the one that says, no, let's go that we may die with him. <laughs> now, it's hard to know if, if Thomas is being fatalistic as in, well, we're all going to die, so let's just go and get it over with. Or if he's being heroic. Um, but he certainly shows himself to be a realist. <laughs> he says, this is likely what's going to happen. They're going to kill Jesus, and they're going to kill us, and so we might as well just go with them, and they can kill all of us. Um, really, uh, Thomas was, is a picture of someone who is a bit of a realist, but again, um, for most of the disciples, the resurrection was a complete surprise. Certainly, there'd be the resurrection, the general resurrection at the end that they believed, but that there'd be a, quote, first fruit of resurrection, that there be a person who would be raised in advances, this was new. And so Thomas, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I see the nail marks in his hands. And I don't really know if Thomas said that as a kind of test. Like, come on, Jesus, show me the nail marks in your hands. If you really are alive, if you really are still alive, come and show me. I don't think so. I think it was, most commentators say, it was a little more sarcastic, right? It was, it was a little more like saying, I'll believe it when I see it. Right, don't we say that when we don't expect something to happen? I believe it when I see it. That's more the force of this. Thomas saying that this, this kind of thing doesn't happen. Um, 
in spite of the raising of Lazarus. So here Thomas is now on the following Sunday. It says eight days later in what you heard, they count inclusively. So this is the next Sunday after Easter Sunday. And Thomas is now together with all the disciples. And the scene is replayed almost exactly. The doors are locked because the disciples fear for their lives. Jesus somehow is suddenly standing among them and says the same thing he said eight days ago. Peace be with you. And he does the same thing for Thomas that he did for the others. He opens up and shows him his wounds. And at that moment, Thomas's belief, or unbelief rather, collapses. There's no evidence that he actually touched the wounds. Again, it was sarcastic. Immediately and simply, he says, my Lord and my God. This I offer to you, by the way, is the high point of John's gospel. The resurrection is a high point. But given John's purposes, given what he desired is that those listening would come to believe Jesus is the Son of God and give their lives to him as the Lord of life, this is the high point. Thomas is the first disciple to say this so plainly. My Lord, that's common, and my God, that is huge. This, in a sense, is the climax. Um, but this climax may be a little disappointing for us. For how does this help us on the side of Jesus' ascent to the Father on this side of it, understanding how one comes to deeper belief? For even in Thomas's case, he got to see Jesus. <laughs> he got to see the resurrected Jesus in the end. And then Jesus' response to him is, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now this is a little bit of a, a, little bit of a puzzle. Is, is Jesus saying that somehow seeing him as Thomas did was somehow inferior to believing in Jesus by faith? Well, I'm not so sure. He doesn't say more blessed are those who believe without seeing he just say, good news for those who don't see it, because guess what? <laughs> you can believe too. And of course, Jesus, when he left the disciples, said, you know, it's better that I go, because if I go, I can send the Holy Spirit to you to kind of love you from the inside. I can actually be closer to you than just this. So in God's providence, and in Jesus' words, the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit gives us access to belief in Jesus, even for those of us who haven't seen him in person. Even John says, you know, I've written all this stuff, I've written all these signs, he says, that you might believe. So we know even John, the gospel writer, it believes that the signs that Jesus did, the miracles that Jesus did, are powerful witnesses to his lordship. And Jesus himself performed these signs for people. So again, it is not that his actual physical presence was somehow, to believe on that is somehow a lack of faith. Um, what Jesus was cautioned people on was just coming for the magic show. But these were part of the things by which people came to believe, both Jesus doing these miracles and the account of him doing those. Strikingly though, in Matthew, when the risen Jesus for the last time gathers together the disciples on a mountain in Galilee where he's going to commission them, right? The Great Commission. Matthew writes this. When they, the disciple, the worship, the, his followers saw him, they worshipped him. But then Matthew adds, but some doubted. <laughs> There's the risen Jesus <laughs> right in front of them. And they worshipped him. <gasps> but some doubted. We get no commentary on that. What did they doubt? That he died? That he was God? Doesn't tell us. But clearly this, this is not the only way that one can come to faith. And even those who saw it, some of those did not come to faith. So what can we learn about the belief from John? How does belief deepen in the age of the Spirit when Jesus says it's actually better for you that I come to you by the Holy Spirit. 
Well, if we look back at the moments of belief or deepened belief in the Gospels, I think we see a little bit of a pattern. And it's this. That belief emerges as one finds themselves personally addressed by Jesus. Not in person. But belief emerges as one finds themselves personally addressed by Jesus. Let's take Mary's encounter with Jesus at the tomb. She saw him but didn't see him. She thought he was the gardener. She heard his voice, but didn't recognize it. She came to believe when Jesus said, Mary. (laughs) Mary. And she, like Thomas, collapses into belief. Rabboni, teacher. We think of the story of Nathaniel in chapter 1 of John. Philip, all excited, comes to Nathaniel and says, we have found the Messiah. Nathaniel, like Thomas, responds sarcastically. I'll believe it when I see it. His words are, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Philip gives up on the project and says, you just need to come and see. So, Philip comes and sees. But just seeing Jesus, of course, the incarnate, not the risen, just seeing Jesus doesn't seem to immediately clinch the deal. What does? It's when Jesus says, here is a man in whom there is no guile. He addresses Nathanael. Nathanael says, how do you know me? And he then says, Rabbi, you are the son of God and the king of Israel. Jesus personally addresses Nathaniel, and with that, shows some knowledge of who Nathaniel is. The same thing, of course, happens to the woman at the well. Jesus personally addresses her and discloses that he knows her. He sees her, and he knows her. And here, Jesus comes to Thomas. And what does Jesus say? Thomas. Thomas. Jesus says, touch my wounds. Thomas is both addressed and known. (laughs) Jesus knew that's what Thomas had said. Supernaturally or otherwise, he addressed Thomas and displayed a knowledge of him. So I think we can say at least two things about coming to deeper belief. Well, first of all, all ways are God's ways. Right? He can make use of anything. So even to look for uh, particular reified patterns of how belief occurs in us is, is not enough. Belief, though, I think we can say, is not something that you and I ground out. Rather, it is something Jesus does in us. Jesus came back for Thomas. He came back for Thomas. It was Jesus' doing. It's really quite interesting, actually, to ask people how they came to believe. I actually make a kind of a point of it. Tell me how you came to believe that Christ was God and the Lord of life. And the varieties of stories I think you'll find are astonishing. All ways are God's ways. I remember years ago when I was uh, working with the C.S. Lewis Foundation, we would have these conferences every three years in Oxford and Cambridge, a week in each place. So we would hear stories from people who knew Lewis at the time, students of his, and one man came to us and, and said uh, that he had had student, uh, Lewis as his tutor, which means his professor. And, you know, it's a one-on-one situation. Uh, and, and Lewis, is, by this time, his reputation as a Christian apologist was well established. And so this student, a non-believer, totally expected Lewis to subtly or unsubtly throughout the course evangelize him in some way because he was such a... Uh, well-known apologist. Um, It was a literary tutorial, right? Not necessarily on theology, but still this young man said, young man at the time, said he was waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, he was on his guard. And Lewis, throughout the whole year, never brought it up. Years later, Lewis came to him in a dream and told him the gospel. 
and the uh, man woke up and believed. <laughs> All ways are God's ways. Um, even last week, uh, Sonia, one of the folks who uh, is part of our body, came here and told me about a, uh, a man named Martin Shaw, a mythologist, Stanford professor, um, world-renowned uh, writer, speaker, who recently, in, in late midlife, came to Jesus as he was walking through a forest. <laughs> He felt God address him. Here too, I guess, we still see the theme. Lewis addresses him as a representative of Jesus in one man's dream. God addresses Martin Shaw in a forest in another man's experience. Of course, these are just the tip of the iceberg. Certainly, testimony, reason, all these things have opened many people up to God, and there are too many ways to list. But what seems critical is to allow ourselves to be addressed by Jesus. To allow ourselves to be addressed by God. Jesus does add one thing to Thomas in the passage we read. He says, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Now that seems a little, a little harsh. <laughs> it's like going to a therapist. You pay them $150 and they say, get over it. He says, stop doubting and believe. Well, you know, these verbs are actually in the present tense, which gives it a little different connotation. It really ought to be translated, stop continuing to not believe, stop continuing to not believe, and start believing. It is now kind of more of a process. Stop going this direction, stop continuing not believing, and start continuing believing. Try the other directions. Move this way. We humans, if we live long enough right, can't help but develop a little cynicism about things. It's part of, I think, part of maturity. Even though it's deep, I mean, it's deep in us. You know, the first recorded words aimed at Adam and Eve are cynical words, right? God doesn't love you. <laughs> That's not why he told you not to eat the fruit. He told you not to eat the fruit because if you did, you'd become like him, and he doesn't want anybody to be like him. That's extremely cynical. <laughs> the serpent was speaking to that in us that has a tendency towards skepticism and cynicism. And I think now, to add to that tendency, we live in a very cynical age, don't we? We're disappointed again and again by heroes or do-gooders who turn out to be liars and cheaters. We're wearied by the failures and misplaced confidences we put in movements. We're disappointed by exaggerated claims for products or for experience, for claims that fail to deliver except financially for the person who's peddling them. How can we not develop an unbelieving and default cynicism. How could we not be moving down that direction in our lives increasingly in this world? Um, how could we not pride ourselves on seeing through everything? What does Jesus want to teach us? What does John want to teach us about believing? Well, I think it's this. I think it's to seek a believing life when it comes to faith. To live as those open to being addressed, to being spoken to, to be befriended by Jesus along the way. What might this look like? Well, you know, it might look like when we read and hear the scriptures to listen for Jesus' voice to us, for the Spirit's voice to us. This is not just an encounter with information or good principles. This is a place of meeting with God, the scriptures are. And so to open that maybe the Spirit has something for me today as I open the scriptures or hear them. Maybe, even as in Jesus' other examples, he wants to show me something about himself, myself. He wants to speak into me and show me that he knows me and receives me. It, to live a life, a believing life in which we are open to be addressed by Jesus may look like having relationships with others who walk with Jesus and to let them speak into our lives like C.S. Lewis spoke into this man's life in a dream. To let Jesus address us through our authentic 
vulnerable stories with one another. Maybe living the believing life and allowing Jesus to address us means going places where God has, in a sense, shown up before for us in creation, the church, among the symbols of the faith, and let Jesus speak to us when he wills to. And finally, to live a believing life and to allow ourselves to be spoken to is to speak honestly to God in prayer. To open our heart fully to him and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? And to ask him for what we need or desire. And when he does, perhaps just through the Holy Spirit, which may sound like our own thoughts, to receive it, to examine it, to explore it, but not to immediately explain it away. Ah, that was just my own thought. Or that was just wishful thinking. See, that's to go that way. C.S. Lewis says, the problem with skepticism is this. You cannot go away explaining everything away forever. Some things are true. You cannot go seeing through things forever. The whole point of seeing something or seeing through something is actually to see something beyond it. We would say to listen to the God who knows you, loves you, and addresses you and receiving his words to you. Let them deepen your belief. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.